Hello everyone, uh, my name is uh, Mathieu Benoyer, I am the CEO at uh, Efficius. Uh, today I will talk to you about uh, well, two projects that I'm working on, uh, the LTTNG project and uh, uh, a Linux system call that I have recently uh, pushed into the mainline Linux kernel, which is called Restartable Sequences, and how those two uh, can come together. Uh, I will first uh, say a few words about uh, what are restartable sequences uh, then how it's useful for the user specs tracer of LTTNG. Uh, I will discuss the upstreaming stages of restartable sequences, miss, uh, discuss the missing pieces, uh, some solutions, and the ongoing effort. So, restartable sequences. Uh, so, it's a, a system call uh, that uh, I created. Uh, uh, and this is re really derived from uh, an original effort uh, from uh, Google, um, uh, mainly Paul Turner and Andrew Alter. Uh, and uh, so I pushed that uh, forward uh, into the Linux kernel, uh, redid the whole thing a few times. Uh, and then it went in uh, for 18. Uh, so it consists of a uh, thread of call storage area that allow user space to perform uh, very fast updates on per CPU data. Uh, so it does so by uh, Basically, so it achieves uh, uh, atomicity uh, with respect to the scheduler activity on one CPU, or let's say one, one core, uh, by uh, aborting. Uh, so whereas in the Linux kernel, when you write kernel code, you have freedom to basically disable preemption for a short while. You access your per CPU data, and you're guaranteed not to be migrated at any point. Uh, however, uh, user space does, does not have uh, that luxury, so we need to abort user space instead. Uh, so this is a small schematic showing, uh, so uh, you can see in uh, orange uh, a critical section. Uh, so that, let's say that you have a block of code, that is your critical section, a continuous, uh, continuous uh, block of code. Uh, you have some abort handler somewhere, uh, which can set uh, elsewhere in the code. Uh, and then, so we, get, we have the two main structures there. So the first one is the uh, restartable sequence ADI. So it's a thread local storage, so it's a, it's a per thread area that uh, is registered to the kernel by using the uh, RSEC system call. So it makes the kernel aware of two things. First of all, of that CPU ID field uh, that is in the thread local storage. Uh, when the kernel knows about this registered uh, TLS uh, and entity. Basically, uh, every time the scheduler is migrating that thread, it's going to make sure that when it comes back to user space, it updates the, current, the CPU ID value, so it's always current. So it's always showing the right CPU number. And then there's the RSEXCS pointer, which points to that struct RSEXCS. So when the user space code is not in a critical section, that pointer is null. When it is entering a crit that critical section, the first instruction that actually consists of that beginning of critical section stores the value uh, to that pointer, this RSXS pointer, to a descriptor of the current uh, critical section, which consists of three things. Uh, the start instruction pointer, the post commit instruction pointer, and the abort ID. And actually in the implementation now, I did not update uh, that slide, but uh, so it's a post commit offset. So it's, it's the offset from the start, start ID, but it's the same concept. And the abort ID is where the kernel should move the execution of that critical section uh, if it preempts it or delivers a signal over it. That's pretty much it. Uh, so what's the use of RSEC for LTT and GUST? So a bit of context, LTTNG UST uh, implements uh, per CPU ring buffers, and this is basically how we shovel a lot of data uh, over uh, shared memory to a consumer daemon. Uh, so that's how we achieve uh, user space tracing uh, pretty, uh, pretty quickly without going to the kernel. Uh, so having per CPU buffers eliminates all sharing uh, between the core, so we don't have cache line bouncing all over the place. Uh, and uh, so it's basically done with a reserve and commit counter scheme. So the reserve is done with an atomic, and I'm talking for the user space tracer here. So the reserve is done with the atomic uh, compare and exchange, and the commit counter, uh, I think it was a, a atomic add. Uh, so 
Uh, and of course, I mean, that part, being persecute data, uh, we could say, well, okay, why does it need to be a log prefix atomic operations for on Intel, for instance? Well, uh, you know, the kernel tracer, broader uh, uh, of that user space tracer, also has persecute ring buffers, and it's actually faster because one thing it can do is uh, write into persecute buffers without uh, caring about migration because it, it, it disables preemption and it knows it's on the right CPU. So here, uh, the goal there is to use RSEC to speed up LTT and GUSD to uh, reach performances that are on par with the kernel tracer. So RSEC can do one thing. So remember I said there's a CPU ID uh, uh, value that we can read? Well, rather than using uh, get CPU, uh, the uh, libc API, which in turn calls into a VDSO, which in turn reads some, uh, uh, I think it's an LSL instruction on Intel. So basically, there's some uh, 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 register in the CPU that contains the right information, or that allows accessing that right information. So rather than going through all those hoops, uh, using RSEC, we can just do a TLS access to get the CPU ID, which is uh, much faster. Our RSEC also uh, replaces atomic operations for the reserve and commit on per CPU data. Uh, so we can do fast loads and store, non atomically, uh, to replace uh, the atomic operations. Uh, so, by the way, some other uses of resourceful sequences. So, uh, having per CPU uh, memory pools for memory allocators. Uh, per CPU ring buffers, per CPU statistics accounting. Uh, so, and, and for these, I mean, the, the benefit of having uh, of using per CPU data structures rather than thread local storage is mainly in the use cases where you have many more threads than you have CPUs. Uh, so, having per CPU data structures allow you to use your uh, memory much more efficiently, your cache lines much more efficiently as well. Uh, other things uh, like per CPU uh, read copy update grace period tracking, uh, and there are some specific use cases. For instance, on big little ARM64, it allows uh, uh, PMU counters read from user space uh, uh, in a way that if it gets migrated from a core that has, let's say, more uh, uh, features to a core that has less features, uh, it's not going to trap uh, when it gets to do the PMU call on the uh, less featured uh, core. Uh, some benchmark numbers, uh, we're talking about speedups here, so uh, for instance, for reading the current CPU number, so I'm comparing here, uh, so in blue we have a true against CPU system call, so 234 nanoseconds. Uh, true GLibc get CPU, well, it's actually slower because we need to call into GLibc, which then does the system call, so it's around roughly 300 nanoseconds. And, uh, however, reading the CPU ID field uh, through a TLS access is only 16 uh, nanoseconds, and this is on a quite slow ARM32 board. Uh, if we compare on x86-64, so if you force doing the, the syscall uh, from user space, uh, it's roughly 50 nanoseconds. If we go, uh, go through GLibc, which uses the VDSO uh, to do the against CPU, uh, then it's roughly 16 nanoseconds. And doing the TLS access to read the CPU ID uh, is less than one nanosecond, so 0 0.8 in this case. Uh, statistics counter, ARM32, uh, uh, get CPU and atomic operation to increment the per CPU counter. We're at 344, we go down to 31, so it's a factor 10. Uh, using our sec on x 64 uh, it's almost a factor 10, it's about, uh, yeah, uh, all, roughly 8. Uh, so from 15 nanoseconds to 2 nanoseconds. Uh, for the ring buffer, so we have to bear in mind that uh, whatever speed up we have is only the part of the code that does uh, getting the current CPU number, the reserve, and the commit. The rest is untouched. So in this case, we uh, go on ARM32 from uh, 2.5 uh, microseconds down to 2.2, and on x 64 from 117 to 98 nanoseconds. So, but this is, I mean, getting that kind of speed up uh, uh, within those ring buffers is actually uh, not trivial. Uh, in terms of Linux integration, uh, so the resourceful sequences went into 4.18, uh, except for the ARM64 and S390 parts uh, that uh, were merged into 4.19. Uh, 
Uh, I'm currently working with the glibc maintainers, uh, so I've submitted uh, the glibc integration for uh, 2.31. Uh, I'm awaiting feedback. I had a couple of rounds of feedback in the past year or so, uh, which I took care of. Uh, it includes registration of the restartable sequence TLS for the main program and for every thread, and the use of restartable sequence to speed up uh, scan get CPU, the library call. So if the TLS is there and registered, we just use that value rather than calling it to the EDS. So what are the missing pieces now? So one of the main missing pieces in the case for LTTNG is to perform uh, updates of per CPU data for other CPUs. So RSEC allows you to play on your per CPU data of, let's say, the current CPU. Uh, but if we look at the, uh, the LTTNG consumer payment, it has a live and switch uh, timers, which, uh, for instance, the live timer is going to periodically uh, do a, a, a sub buffer switch to push out uh, trace data. Uh, it's similar for the switch timer. Uh, and the thing is, that consumer demon, uh, it needs to do it for all, all the buffers. Uh, and uh, we cannot use uh, CPU affinity reliably to do that because, I mean, someone might be unplugging, un unplugging uh, CPUs while we do that. And uh, so CPU affinity is just a hint. It's, it's not a hard requirement. So if there is CPU at unplug of a CPU, it might move you away to another CPU that you did not expect to run. So it cannot be used for correctness. Um, therefore, I mean, so trying to access other CPUs, buffers in this case, is a problem. Another missing piece, uh, so as I'm discussing the libc integration, they want to use it in libc uh, the maintainers, uh, especially for uh, the memory allocator. So we're talking about early and very late use in libc initialization and in the thread lifetime and cases where the uh, restartable sequence uh, TLS is not yet registered. Uh, so within the libc and dynamic link initialization, in preloaded pre library constructors, it also happens quite early. Uh, the audit libraries, the iPhone resolvers, uh, and the signal enders might, might nest very early over the thread lifetime or very late. Uh, so that's another missing piece where a restartable sequence alone, I mean, we, we cannot use a combination of restartable sequence and atomic operations on two different CPUs because this is really not compatible. Uh, the rest, restartable sequence data might be corrupted underneath its feet uh, by the atomic or operation running on another CPU. Uh, and uh, so, and the other missing piece is to guarantee progress uh, for debugger single stepping on current debuggers. Uh, because if, let's say, you have uh, that critical section, uh, that you basically run it at once or you get aborted. And uh, if you get aborted, let's say, by a debugger which tries to single step each and every instruction of these and always preempts you, you and if you choose as an abort strategy, to just jump back over and start over again, you never progress and you stay in a state place. So this is something I really do not want to uh, add as a problematic behavior into applications. So, uh, so that's why I have prototype branches, but not actually, it's not actually currently integrated uh, in the upstream LTTNG USD. So, but I did work on solutions for this. So I'm, I have a new system called, uh, called which I uh, call do on CPU, uh, and I did previous submissions as a CPU of you. Uh, and uh, so that do on CPU system call implements a eBPF bytecode interpreter within the kernel. Uh, so it's it's either running so so currently it's running into an IPI handler. I'm contemplating running it in thread context for kind of longer critical sections. Uh, but I mean, uh, I'm, I'm very concerned uh, about uh, real-time responsiveness of the system. So I do not want to disable interrupts or uh, scheduler uh, uh, for too long. So these are things I still have to discuss with the upstream maintainers. Uh, and it's specialized, so, so it's not the full feature set of the BPF bytecode. Uh, so it's specialized to only load and store to, uh, from and to user space memory of the current process. Uh, so, uh, it, and the purpose there is that it can be used as a fallback when a restartable sequence is not registered for the current thread, or if a restartable sequence aborts due to pure preemption. Uh, 
And this solution solves all the missing pieces that I have. If I have this, I can integrate RSEC and CPU uh, and do ups on the CPU uh, within the LTT and GUSD uh, tracer. So my ongoing efforts. Uh, so the first is to upstream the restartable sequence uh, TLS registration within Jellipsy. Uh, so it's currently submitted, being reviewed by maintainers. Uh, and then as a request from Linus Torvalds, so before he sees uh, emerge any other code that are kind of on top enhancements to restartable sequences, uh, he wants uh, us to justify the existence of restartable sequences by showing users. But uh, it's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem because until you have the complete infrastructure, there are many use cases that people can't, just cannot deploy. So we are trying to focus on the specific use cases that are enabled by RSEC alone, uh, and there are quite a few, uh, so that we can then justify RSEC and the extra pieces uh, that I want to push, which is do on CP, uh, which I can also justify because there are quite a few use cases. Uh, so that's the step I'm at now. Um, before I can go to step three, which is to consider upstreaming the CPU by code interpreter, a system called into Linux, and uh, then I can complete the integration of RSEC and do one CPU with the LTT and GUSD. Um, yeah, so that's uh, that's basically what I have. Now we have time for questions. Any questions? All right. So well, I can, I'm, uh, then I, I can go on on a few things. Uh, so in terms of uh, so there are quite a few use cases for RSEC. Uh, some of them uh, are within open source projects like memory locators and things like that. Uh, I've had the discussions with uh, Google people who wanted to integrate it uh, within uh, TC Malloc. Um, and uh, I, so if you have use cases where uh, you don't care about running a, a, your program through a debugger uh, with single stepping, then you could do uh, <coughs> use of RSEC in your in-house application for things like statistics uh, counting with per CPU uh, um, data, uh, per CPU counters. Uh, and uh, so, so everything is there to do that now. Uh, so I, also created a library called librsec, which really uh, make life much easier for user space applications to use restartable sequences. So it implements all the basic APIs uh, to uh, do a compare and exchange on per CPU data, a add on per CPU data, and all the basic use cases. Um, so uh, if if you have such uses of RSEC, if you that today, uh, please let me know about it. And uh, ideally, in a way where I, I could keep a list of who's using which features of our sec for what, uh, what are the constraints that they have, how, uh, uh, which things need more features uh, as well uh, in order to be kind of more complete. So, uh, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm really at the stage where I need community feedback in order to facilitate uh, pushing the rest of what I need to push into the Linux kernel. Thank you. I have a question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Probably it's a silly, like, uh, newbie question, but is there an application of um, this for user space application running on top of real time kernels? Maybe uh, real time kernels? I mean, some people are using LTT and GUST, for instance, to trace their real time user space application. LTT and GUST has been designed to be able to do that. Uh, there are, I think we done, documented a few things you need to tweak in your application to make sure that uh, only the parts of LTT and GUST which are really real-time, uh, providing the real-time guarantee, get, get called by your real-time threads. Uh, and yeah, you need to uh, put a specific mode where the consumer daemon, which is an external process, is going to call and check if there's data, rather than using a write system call when a sub offer is pulled from your real-time thread. So there's a bit of tweaking you need to do, but if you do that, then you can use LTT and GUSD in real-time context. Uh, and I mean, and RSEC can speed up LTT and GUSD, so you, you have less overhead on your system, more time for your workload. That's one case. Uh, the other cases I have in mind is more about read copy updates. Uh, so I also maintain the user space uh, read copy update library project. And um, 
So there are interesting uh, uh, recopy of the flavors we can implement with this. I have a prototype branch as well, where you can define a RCU domain, uh, which is basically a bunch of per-CPU counters. And RSEC is great for incrementing per-CPU counters very efficiently. Uh, so, uh, and, and that I can see being used a lot in real-time applications because, uh, so recopy update libraries allow you to have a wait-free read site. So in, in schemes where you need to have uh, data, let's say, exchanged between a non-real-time thread, which, let's say, publishes control information, and then you have a bunch of real-time threads which really need to uh, reply to the input as quickly as possible, but they need to sample that control information, then using a recopy update is a great way to do it, uh, basically without any locking. Uh, it's just providing uh, existence for entities. Thank you. Any other question? Thank you. Right. Thank you very much.